Hi, I'm Malika Bilal, and you've landed in the stream's online pre-show. Lucky you. This is where we loosen up before the TV cameras go live. So today, our foreign aid experts keeping people poor. Economist William Easterly is here to explain why he thinks so. And to help us flesh out his ideas, Daniel Kaufman, president of Revenue Watch Institute. Ken Opalo, a PhD candidate at Stanford University, and Ingrid Harbold Kavan Graven, a master's Kavan Graven, excuse me, a master's student at the New School for Social Research. Don't worry, Ingrid, I will get that right in the main <laughs> show. What, one of these times. So um, before we get started, I want to introduce you to my co-host, who I couldn't do it without, Dan Ming. Dan, what's your role? Hello, I am the digital producer, so it is my job to get your comments on the air. I want everyone out there to head to their computers, tweet me with the hashtag AJStream, and I'll read your comments on the show. Looking forward to that. Was there already a tweet though, that you wanted to bring up? There was one tweet, and I have to ask Bill about this. <laughs> so <laughs> Kevin, who was at your talk, you gave a talk at Georgetown University yesterday, he tweeted in, the man, myth, and legend scratch that. The uncanny wit of Bill Easterly Grace Georgetown enjoyed the surprise, ter terror, shock, and awe. So what does he mean by that, shock and awe? Was there anything shocking to your speech yesterday? <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the one thing that I noticed online was mm -hmm. a whole bunch of policy students, grad students who were kind of geeking out uh, yeah. about the speech, loving yeah. it. Some had questions, some had pushback, but yeah. that's, yeah. I, that's yeah. how what I feel like the show is going to be about. So I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited yeah. to learn. Um, yeah. I want to start our little round table as we're warming up to just get a sense into why all of you are in this field to begin with. So Bill, what is it that drew you to the field of aid, development? What is it that speaks to you? Well, I was part of the aid establishment myself for 16 years at the World Bank. And there was kind of a gradual process of, um, I'm sorry to say, a disillusionment with aid that it wasn't really delivering results for poor people around the world. Mm -hmm. It sort of set me off on a long intellectual journey <laughs> that oh, <sorry>. <laughs> it, took, it took three books to work that out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's uh, our gain <laughs> while you figured it out. <laughs> right. It's documented. It's <laughs> yes. all documented. Right. It's all exactly. documented. Yeah. Your evolution. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. Ingrid, what about you? <laughs> what drew you to this field? Um, I actually, I grew up in developing countries, so that's probably a large part of it. And I started studying development after high school. And uh, the first NGO I was drawn to was one that... Uh, showed how for every dollar of aid a country receives, five dollars would leave a developing country in debt repayments. Um, so that inspired me from when I was 18, I guess, to look into the structures of development and mm -hmm. the political economy. Great story. Uh, Daniel Kaufman, what drew you to this field? Well, I'm, I'm from Chile. I grew up in Chile and I was <coughs> fortunate enough uh, to to grow up in a middle class family, but in a country at the time was very poor, unequal, and not very well uh, governed. So I became very interested in, in issues of poverty and development. And then like Bill, I joined the World Bank. So uh, we were colleagues there. And then I was sent by the World Bank um, when I, before I had gray hair <laughs> to lead the effort and open the whole program of, of the World Bank in Ukraine when the Iron Curtain falls and my second day in the job a deputy minister from the oil guard asked me for a $20,000 uh, bribe if I was ever going oh, wow. to get wow. a housing or, or an office. So I started learning very quickly that just being a, a PhD in economics was not enough and one needed I'm sure. I'm to sure. focus on, on other issues too. Well, a lot, lot of expertise here. Ken, in our 30 seconds left, what drew you to this field? Um, I grew up in Kenya. Uh, I'm from Nairobi. And uh, as a freshman in undergrad, I volunteered uh, to Ghana with uh, an NGO to work at a hospital. And that's when I decided that I should go to grad school and study more about the political impediments to development, some of which uh, Bill Easterly points out in the book. Well, I'm looking forward to what, he, what you all have to say in the main show. That's all the time we have for now. See you in 30 seconds. Hi, I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. 
today. Is foreign aid propping up dictators and keeping people poor? Economist William Easterly joins us to talk about what he calls the tyranny of experts. Our digital producer, Dan Ning, is here scouring through your comments. Dan, what are you seeing already? So Malika, a lot of the stream's online community members are from developing countries. So we asked them, has foreign aid helped your country develop a sustainable economy? And here's what one person responded. Akendra from Nepal said, Nepalese have yet to see what aid has done in this almost half a century now to us, besides making the country depend more on aid. Now, regardless of what country you're from, we want to hear from you. So tweet me with the hashtag AJStream. Looking forward to this. And next to us is the man causing all of this talk, William Easterly. William is the author of The Tyranny of Experts and professor of economics at New York University. Thanks for joining us for what promises to be a lively conversation. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. Well, the power of our show comes from people like you. So to join the conversation, just head over to facebook.com slash AJStream. Click like. I've already liked it. And you, too, will be in the stream. I'm Ian Gordon, I'm the copy editor at Mother Jones Magazine, and I'm in the stream. No democracy, no aid. That's the policy economist William Easterly is pushing in his latest book, The Tyranny of Experts. He suggests Western development experts are keeping people poor. How? According to Easterly, the UN and other Western-funded bodies provide technical assistance to autocratic governments to reduce poverty. But, he says, dictators just want to stay in power. So they take money to pave the roads, but they keep citizens downtrodden so they can't challenge authority. So what's the alternative? Free development. Easterly says if foreign countries stopped funding autocrats, people would be free to dream up marketable ideas that could drive their own economies. With so many nations rumbling for political change, think the Middle East, Europe, Africa, Easterly suggests foreign aid experts are on the wrong side of democratic change. Is he right? Well, William Easterly is here to explain all of this, and with us to test his ideas a bit are, in Oslo, Daniel Kaufman, president of Revenue Watch Institute and a former World Bank economist. In Chicago, Ken Opalo, a Nairobi native and PhD candidate in political science at Stanford University. And in New York, Ingrid Harvold Kavan Graven is studying economics at the New School for Social Research. Welcome to all of our guests, excited to get this conversation started. So Bill, you've been in development for approximately 30 years. 30 years what was the impetus yes. <laughs> to writing this book now? Well, I've really been on a, a long intellectual journey trying to understand why aid has not delivered on its original promises and also on some of the ideas that aid perpetrates. And the new book on the tyranny of experts is really a protest against the mistaken idea that autocratic govern governments and dictators are actually part of the solution that is implementing good technical changes financed by Western philanthropists and aid agencies to make their countries develop. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a good justification that dictators use to stay in power, that we have sort of like what we could call the development right of dictators. They, they, they justify their own existence by all the great development things that they're doing. So lay it out for us. Who is propagating these mistaken ideas, as you say? Well, I think it's the whole, uh, the whole kind of mainstream development establishment and the, the official aid agencies, some of the large private philanthropies like the Gates Foundation. Uh, it's all about technical solutions implemented by the government in power, which is the dictator. You know? And what they're not really seeing is that how pow progress against poverty really happens is when citizens can demand that their own governments do the technical solutions that will help them. Dictators never naturally do benevolent things on their own. They mainly just want to stay in power. And they do that by doing the opposite of development. They repress their citizens' rights. They don't let them speak up and protest when public services are bad. And the pr that kind of protest is exactly what you need to make public si services be good, to make the technical fixes to poverty, like, say, bed nets for malaria or you know, medicines for malaria, antibiotics for diseases, all these great things that would deliver 
the end of poverty and the end of disease, to make those things happen, you need democratic accountability that forces government to do good things. It doesn't happen naturally from, mm -hmm. from autocrats. Well, the best way to break this down really is to provide examples. Now, Dan, yes. I know uh, just last month, I believe it was, the World Bank announced 1.2 billion package for Tunisia. Yes, I'd actually like to dive into this example of Tunisia. We have a video sure. comment from a Tunisian member of parliament. Her mm -hmm. name is Mabruka Mubarak, and mm -hmm. take a listen to what she has to say. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Mabrouk Ambarak. I'm a member of the Tunisian Parliament. What we've been observing since the uprising in 2011 is that the World Bank, the IMF, and Partnership of Dovi, and so on, are bringing loans t with conditions to implement neoliberalism. The same policies proposed to Ben Ali, and that were the contributing factors to the economic downfall prior to the revolution. Everything is connected. Europe tells us, I'll give you money if you follow the IMF condition. Partnership of Dovi tells us to do private-public partnership, and the World Bank is involved. I mean, we're stuck. How do we get out of this? What's the alternative? So, Bill, she's saying that they're being offered these loans from the IMF and the World Bank, but there are these conditions that they don't want to accept, or at least she doesn't want to as a Tunisian politician. What would you say to that? Yeah, this is part of a, a long history over the past couple of decades of World Bank and IMF coercion of poor countries to do what the World Bank and IMF experts think is the right thing to do. That is really the tyranny of experts. And you know, even if their advice was right, it would lead to a backlash against the, the coercion, against the pressure by foreigners to do what foreigners want. And so you know, this is not the way that beneficial change happens. Beneficial change happens when citizens are in power democratically themselves to decide what is the best solution for themselves. Homegrown development where people choose by democratic process what are the right economic policies. That is the way that, that progress happens, not by external coercion by, by the experts. Right, and I'd like to actually hear from Daniel Kaufman on the same point. What do you think about this? Well, first, I think there's a very important message by, by Bill in the book. Uh, nowadays, even if it has been said before, which uh, Bill acknowledges, because what's happening with a part of the international official community of donors regarding support for anti-democratic repressive regime is that in many cases it has become more nuanced, sophisticated, uh, with a semblance of concerns by some of the donors. And many repressive regime now know better how to play the game. They pretend to have elections, but they're repressive. So there's a very important message about official um, aid to repressive uh, regimes. At the same time, um, let's be clear, Tunisia is one of the bright lights, and it's one of the countries in the Arab Spring that we cannot and we ought not call a uh, run by tyrants to the contrary. It's a major opening before the revolution. And we, we trace over 10 years, more and more aid was going to repressive regimes throughout the Arab aid, the official aid. And that uh, we decried that and it's, it's part of the record. But now a country like Tunisia deserves collaboration and, and support, including technocratic one. But obviously um, it has to be done with a lot of consultation using the democratic institutions that are developing there. That's why we are also involved there, international NGOs and others at the request of civil society and others. And we should also pressure organizations like the IMF and the World Bank to, uh, to go with the right inclusive pro-growth policies and so on, rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying that Tunisia ought not get any of this support. Well, you know, it's interesting. He mentioned uh, Tunisia being the bright spot in this. But, Bill, there are other countries who uh, went through their, their uprisings, the Arab uprisings, and yeah, then had yeah. what would be termed as democratically elected new governments that aren't necessarily ensuring human rights in their country, but they're democratically elected. So yeah. do we withhold aid? What, what happens there? Well, let's be clear that democracy is about much more than just majority voting. And it's, you know, th it is quite possible for what we call majoritarian tyranny to happen under democracy, in which the majority does oppressive things to minority groups like, say, the cops in Egypt. And wait, so democracy, a full definition of democracy, has to include protection for individual rights. Where each, where each citizen is thinking, hey, I want to be protected against what the government does to me, even if it's a democratically elected government, because you know I, I could be a victim of that oppression. So I vote for okay. actually restrictions on the power of the majority, even if it's a democratic majority, to protect my basic human rights, my basic freedom of speech, freedom of religion, all these basic human rights. 
All right, I'd actually like to, to turn this to Ken now. So we asked our online community if democracy should be a prerequisite for foreign aid, and we had one response, B9 tweets, and he said, not democracy if it's defined, designed, and bought by organizations outside the affected area, then it's neocolonialism. So Ken, what do you have to say to that? Who gets to define democracy? Yeah, and uh, <coughs> I think that Bill is right uh, in the book in pointing out the need to have local solutions to the problems afflicting the developing world. And that applies to uh, political development as well. Uh, democratic systems, if imposed from outside, uh, often fail. And, and, you know, we've had 50 years of attempts at uh, regime change and, you know, electoral democracy being introduced in countries that may not have had the requisite conditions for democracy to take hold. And um, this leads me to a question that I had for Bill. Um, you know, there's very little empirical evidence that democracy or freedoms per se uh, have a causal relationship with economic development uh, and growth. Uh, so might, do you think you might be overselling the idea? Uh, and I ask this because uh, in many of the you know, developing countries, the, the main problem in my view seems to be uh, an endemic lack of state capacity. So whether under dictatorship or under democracy, these countries do not have the requisite state capacity to immunize children, uh, educate their children, or build roads, or regulate trade, and the like. So, you know, is state capacity the omitted variable here, as opposed to focusing on either tyranny or democracy? And, and Ken, I love it, as you're asking your question, Bill is chuckling. Bill, what's your answer? Yeah, well, Ken, um, you know, actually one thing I'm proud of that I admitted in the book is that the evidence is not as strong as I would like it to be. I wish we did have like a rigorous laboratory experiment showing that democracy causes prosperity in a definitive way. We don't have that. We'll never have that. What we have is kind of the relative weight of the evidence that is much stronger on the democracy side but than the autocracy side. And we have to choose. Everybody is going to choose. And so we're going to have to not demand some absolute rigor of evidence, but ask what is the relative weight of the evidence and which side is it stronger? You know, where, where are all the examples of prosperity created by authoritarian governments? There are very few and far between. Where are the yeah, examples of prosperity credit created by a long process of high and growing democratic freedoms? Well, that's, you know, North America, Western Europe, Japan, now spreading to South Korea, Taiwan, Chile freedom is spreading to Africa and, and Asia, and as freedom spreads, economic growth happens. A lot of the growth miracles are associated with big increases in both economic and political freedom. So I think the body of evidence is stronger Sorry. on the, the freedom side than on the autocracy side. Uh, Daniel, you're yeah, raising your yeah, hand. I want uh, uh, well, to I, I get back to you, Ken, but Daniel's raising his hands. He looks like he really wants to get in here. Daniel, go ahead. Well. No, I, it's to both backstop Bill, but also to push, push him further uh, and uh, away from, from Western democratic uh, no notions. I mean, the basic notions of, of individual freedoms, the freedom to associate, freedom of expression, free press, uh, freedom also of complete endemic corruption at the top, kleptocratic, kleptocracies and so on. And, you know, we have worked for so long on those type of data and indicators. Once you, you start using that type of data, it shows very clearly that it is an enormous divi uh, development dividend payoff. It's a 300% we calculated, three times increase in incomes of a capital country, that uh, when they tackle those issues. So once one starts broadening and, and, and bundling these issues to, to the free press and the others, it becomes a clearer picture. And I think it's really important to unbundle it because uh, right now, freedom of the press is under attack while countries are going through more formal pretend elections, for instance. Bill? Uh, I, I, I agree with Danny on what he's saying. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I uh, believe it as strongly as Danny does, but I believe the relative weight of the evidence is, is much stronger in the way that I said. Well, Ingrid, I know that you want to get in on this conversation. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, I think this distinction between autocracy and democracy is not necessarily as useful. Um, and it's true that it's hard to establish a causal relationship, but actually some economic historians have looked at how um, your Europe developed, for example, and the East Asian miracle countries, and they find that um, the government promoting certain policies in these countries 
uh, led them to have high growth and development and that individual freedoms actually came into place well into this process or even after. Um, so there might even be uh, a different causal relationship, um, government policies causing uh, development and not necessarily individual freedoms. And Bill, your thoughts? Yeah, Ingrid, I think you're talking about uh, policies like trade <laughs> protection or industrial policy. I think the evidence on those is, is very disputed, very, very mixed. I'd, you know, even if you do believe in a sort of modest, some modest successes from industrial policy and trade, well, what's the big thing going on in the world over this period? Even if some countries, in, uh, even if the U.S. had some protection during its history, the big thing going on was the explosion of trade that happened due to the enormous fall in transport costs that made for a globalized world. That enormous fall in, in transport costs was like a big trade opening that happened everywhere in the world and led to uh, this global boom in development that we've had ever since uh, the end of World War II that has brought everyone along. So, you know, I don't think that, the, that those historians are really giving a, a minority view that is giving a kind of exaggerated importance to a few small protective legislation and industrial policies. That's not the big picture. So, Bill, I want to ask you a question that came in from Twitter. We have uh, Reginald tweeted in. He said, why are ex-World Bank officials critical of aid? What do they know now that they didn't know then? <laughs> so I want to ask That's you this, as someone That's who used to work in the World Bank. That's a great question. Well, I guess it's, uh, you, it's what economists call learning by doing. You know, when, you, when you're in the process of doing something, I mean, you asked earlier about Tunisia being sort of coerced by... Uh, by uh, the World Bank and the IMF. You know, I was in the World Bank and the IMF when we were coercing countries, when we imposed shock therapy on Russia that backfired and has, is partly responsible for the, the huge depression that happened after the end of communism that set the stage for the rise of Putin. Uh, I was there when we were imposing structural adjustment on Latin America that sort of backfired with, uh, say, in Bolivia, where a populist government took power and said, you know, we reject all this, and actually went too, way too far in the opposite direction of doing really anti-growth policies. It's now you're reformed. And, and so now I'm, I'm sort of like a recovering expert, you know, I'm sort of like starting my own group of authoritarians anonymous, you know, inviting my <laughs> fellow recovering experts to join me. You know, you learn in your own career where you have made mistakes, and then you try to do, do penance by telling everyone else about your own mistakes and what you've learned from them. That's what I'm doing. I think that's what Danny might be doing. That's, that's, what, uh, that's what's going on here. And of course, our, our two students who are here learning from our <laughs> professors. So Ken, I want to go to you. I know you wanted to get in. Yeah, uh, uh, just to go back to the economic history question, I mean, uh, you know, in these mid 18th century when the industrial revolution really takes off in Europe and, uh, and then after that in the US uh, these countries were not you know real democracies uh, oh, you sure. know, still sure. suffrage suffrage limitations and the like uh, and so you know it's 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 and it, the US isn't really democratized until the 60s when uh, you have suffrage extended to African Americans in the south sure. 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 so you know I think that the uh, you know, Bill, do you think you might be overselling the idea that democracy is the answer, given you know the overwhelming evidence that uh, it takes a lot more than just freedoms to to get things going on the economic front? Well, I, I think you, you answered the first part about whether or not you're overselling democracy, but it does take more than just freedoms. Can you you speak to that part of Ken's question? Well, I'm yeah, I'm glad that Ken. I'm really glad that you're you're raising the U.S. history and and the you know the of course the horrible scars on U.S. history of slavery and oppression of African Americans. <coughs> so you know what we're really talking about here. We're not talking about you have to jump to some democratic utopia before anything good will happen. Will happen. You know that's not the the message that I'm trying to sell. What I'm trying to sell is you start with an ideal. You know, in the Declaration of Independence unalienable rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Even though those ideals were not honored at the time, you know, they were more honored in the U.S. and a few other democratic places like, uh, more democratic places like the U.K. at that time than elsewhere. That's where the Industrial Revolution started. And then it got more life as freedom expanded. You know, finally slavery was ended. Finally, you know, women were given the vote. Blacks were given the vote. Uh, there's still, it's still a very much a work in progress. You know, blacks, of course, are still very much discriminated against in the U.S. Very still, well, well, an well oppressed speaking group. Of works in progress. So it's a work in progress. Right. You know, it's a gradual process of the growth of freedom 
that translates into the growth and development. These two things go together. And so that's looking at it from a history lens, and you're saying it's a work in progress. So I, I want to take us to something that, that's happened not too long ago. Um, it's actually what you opened your book with, an yeah, incident that yes. happened in Uganda in yeah. 2010. Uh, yeah. We're going to show some pictures of, uh, uh, of the town in Uganda where a group of farmers returned home after church on Sunday, uh, one Sunday, and they found soldiers with guns who basically were burning down their homes and telling them the land no longer belonged to them. And I, thought, I think what was really interesting is in the book you say the World Bank never investigated its actions because the World Bank was financing a British company that was taking over the land to, to use it, to develop it for timber. So uh, take yeah, us yeah, through that yeah. incident. Yeah, this happened on February 28, 2010. So, um, you know, recently we had the fourth anniversary of this tragic, tra tragic incident. And this was, you know, this incident was exposed by Oxfam, and then it did show up on the front page of the New York Times. But what really shows kind of like the attitude of the aid community and of the World Bank specifically is the two non-events that happened afterwards. First of all, at first, the World Bank promised to investigate its own role in this tragedy. But then the first non-event is they have never done this investigation. They never did the investigation. Four years later, it has never been done. The second non-event is nobody really protested that so they did not investigate. So I, I'd, I'd like to uh, jump yeah. in here. We yeah, actually yeah. have a video comment from a woman named Gina who helped mediate the dispute um, yeah, with I, the community. I, I, Can I, I just play this and let's hear your response? Sure, sure. Gina Barberi, Senior Specialist Dispute Resolution Compliance Advisor Ombudsman. In exercising its right to self-determination, the Mulbendi community chose dispute resolution, leading to the acquisition of 500 acres of land, the resettlement of households, and the prospect of securing livelihoods. The freedom which comes from land tenure is exactly the type of incremental, positive, rights-based change that you argue for in your book. Why is this reality so different to the one you depict? So Bill, Gina's directly criticizing your portrayal of events in your book. What do you, what yeah. do you say to this? I mentioned the mediation process in the book and um, you know, what the, the main effect of the mediation process was to kind of shut everybody up, unfortunately. Um, all of the parties to the mediation were, were said that they would only get compensation if they remained silent, if the details of the settlement remained confidential. You know, even Oxfam was participating in, the, in these, this mediation, and they were forced to shut up. They were forced to stop their own protest, their own advocacy on this enormous human rights violation. And so it was an effective device for making everyone forget that, th that this had happened. You know, no one ever heard about this. Uh, and Oxfam and the community all agreed that the, uh, the compensation to Mubende was, was pathetic and inadequate. They never had the option of going back to the status quo that happened before these tragic events. And the most important thing of all is the CAO um, um, bu ombudsman that uh, this comment refers to they, they never fulfilled their own statutory responsibility to investigate the World Bank's own role in these events. That's the key missing thing that, that she is not saying. You know, they, you know, they had an uh, obligation to investigate their own role, only and they did not do of, it. Uh, out of time, sure, and, sure. And, I, and I hear you on that point, but we hear stories like that, and, and we yeah. hear the criticisms in, in, in the majority yeah. of your book. Our community wants to know what about solutions. I mean, people watching well. this are going to know what, what's your solution to this. <laughs> Well, the solution is already happening all over the world, and the solution is not coming from, you know, white middle-aged professors like me. It's coming from people around the world asserting their own democratic rights, asserting their own economic rights. You know, there's uh, a lot of the economic reforms in China were started by a peasant resistance movement that demanded to do individual family plots instead of, of collective Of course, they don't farming. have democracy in China. Uh, they don't have democracy yet. Uh, dissidents are campaigning for democracy, but it is still far better than the dark days under Mao. So there's been a positive change, definitely in economic freedom in China, and some in political freedom compared to you know the Cultural Revolution in China. Positive change. I like that we're ending on that note, Dan. <laughs> is there an ending note you'd like I'd to like give to us to get from the community? One less comment in from our community. So Cobso on Facebook writes and he says. Um, Aid, being aid is being used to stifle democratic values. He gives the example of Ethiopia. He says, implementation of democracy must be compulsory criteria for aid. We'll talk about that, of course, in the post show. Stay with us. That post show is next. It's dreams.aljazeera.com. On the next show, we tackle poverty again, but from a very different angle. What if countries adopted a basic income instead of the welfare programs in place? Would it work? Find out tomorrow. Till then, we'll see you online.
Welcome back. You're in the Streams Online Post Show. We're talking about William Easterly, Easterly's new book on aid, The Tyranny of Experts. Let's jump back in. Now, before we ended the main show on television, we were talking about solutions, and he was you were giving us one, but I want to go to Ingrid in our hangout because Ingrid had a question on this topic. Ingrid, go ahead. Um, so you criticize the World Bank a lot in your book uh, and point to lots of uh, disastrous projects. And I'm wondering, as a <coughs> former insider at the bank, if you have any ideas of how it could be reformed, or do you prefer, would you prefer that it was just shut down? Well, you know, first of all, we have to say, what's the atmosphere for reform? It's not a matter of sort of technical recommendations to make reforms at the World Bank happen. It's a matter of changing the political climate. Um, frankly, a lot of what the World Bank does is is often in the service of Western foreign policy interests, U.S. foreign policy interests. I mean, why does Uganda get so much aid? Why can a World Bank operate with impunity in Uganda? It's because Uganda is a major U.S. ally in the war on terror. And that's the politics that the World Bank is well, facing. Is there so a way to detangle so uh, you know, that's those politics with aid? Is there a way well, to separate those two things? You know, I mean, I think the way I think of, po of change happening, uh, Ken referred earlier to the kind of the oppression of blacks in the U.S. Um, how did positive change happen with the civil rights movement in, in the U.S.? You know, what happened was that there was a principle that was not accepted by white Americans, that blacks and whites are equal and deserve equal rights. That was not accepted. And blacks protested that hypocrisy, that equal rights were not accepted. They were asserting a principle and then protesting s and dramatizing specific violations of that principle in the sit-ins and the freedom rides on the buses and the lunch counters and the, you know, the uh, Rosa Parks on the bus refusing to give up her seat. Mm -hmm. That was the vehicle of change. Right. That you protest a uh, violation of a principle. And I think that's the way to change the political climate for the bank. When we get so outraged that the rights of poor people are being violated, then the World Bank would be forced to, to no longer operate right. with impunity to respect the rights of poor people. Yeah, I'd like to actually turn back to Daniel. So Daniel, we have a tweet here from Mickey. He said, poor nations need not aid, they need democratic freedom within and fair trade to compete in the global market. I want to ask you about that question of fair trade, Daniel. How important do you think it is to change trade conditions and trade terms? Fair trade is very, uh, very important, but as important nowadays is how countries will deal with their own domestic resources and natural resources. One question I have for, for Bill is at, at what point we can push you to write the next book because you're so disillusioned with aid about what matters much more in Africa. Nowadays, we're talking about $400 billion in terms of the value of natural resources being extracted versus only $50 billion that is going from aid. So aid is becoming less relevant anyway. So, and, and what's happening with the governance, the use, the extraction of these resources in some countries being totally misgoverned and others better governed is the development challenge of the generation for Africa and many, many other countries. So at some point we should move on and, and talk about issues like trade, but also not natural res resources which are, being, uh, which are not being uh, done enough. And that's why we work on that. Secondly, just to be clear, I, I don't think we should throw so quickly the baby out with the bathwater. We may be critics of aid, but in, in my case, I'm a critic of unselective uh, aid that also goes to dictators and repressive government. But in the case when it goes where there are individual freedoms and rights, and we haven't discussed that, because for every Uganda, Ethiopia, and Azerbaijan, there's also a Botswana, a Ghana, Estonia, Peru, or Chile. And Korea and many countries that have benefited from aid, not only World Bank, IMF, but from, from others. So how to uh, leverage and use more of these resources going to countries that have individual freedoms where they request and the citizens request expertise and know-how as well. So let's, let's not throw it all out of the window because it must be, must be very important to collaborate, to cooperate with these countries with know-how and expertise where these individual freedoms are granted. Well, it, it, he, he said yeah. collaborate. He also mentioned a possible new book. Perhaps the two of you, as former <laughs> colleagues, could collaborate <laughs> on that. But, sure, but what, sure. what's, your, what's your response? Well, you know, I agree aid is a very small player. And I actually, do, the book is mainly not about aid. And I do want to, I have, I have already moved on beyond aid. Aid is just an example of how we don't respect the rights of the poor. But most of the book is about the good things that will happen 
when, uh, when we do recognize the rights of, of citizens, that that is the engine of development, that was the engine of development in the West, that, will, that is already becoming and will become more the engine of development in the rest of just individual rights in which people can demand their governments be held democratically accountable, including governments that are flush with natural resources, that citizens can force them to not, you know, divert all the proceeds into their own pockets and force them to spend it on cleaning up the water supply. You know, that's, what, that's the good thing that will happen, and that's, these are the ideas that drive development that are much more important than these, these small aid questions that we're talking about. All right, I'd actually like to turn back to Ken. So Ken, we have a tweet here from Karen Adia. She says, are academic policy schools complicit in perpetuating the problematic system of development technocracy? What do you think about that, Ken? Um, Especially <coughs> given that <laughs> you are a student, uh, a, a political yeah. science PhD candidate. Um, I mean, I think that uh, the, yeah, the focus on technical solutions in policy schools is definitely uh, a hindrance uh, to more openness to ideas from the ground. Uh, and you know, if if you look at any development economic syllabus uh, in the U.S. or or elsewhere, uh, it's especially in the U.S., uh, it's mainly heavy on you know potential technical solutions. And I think there's a there's a tendency to equate successes, say, in public health interventions, which I should say have been massively successful uh, in places like Rwanda and also where uh, infant mortality rates are dropping uh, precipitously. And that's because in public health it's easy to implement these policies. It gets harder when you try to do the same with the actual uh, process of trying to increase uh, income uh, for households. Uh, that that's a much bigger process that requires uh, great investments, uh, not just by the donors uh, and and volunteers, but also by by act by states. Um, which which then brings me to a question that I think Bill still did not uh, address uh, to my satisfaction, and that is the question of state capacity. Um, you know, it's it's easy it's easy for as as. As Daniel was pointing out, you know, Botswana and others developed from aid because the governments could take the aid and use it, uh, you know, in a way that was welfare improving for their citizens. Uh, the World Bank, for instance, says that 30% of, of monies uh, in the budgets of African governments gets wasted uh, for corruption. But, I mean, I think the bigger number that we should be focusing on is the 70%. Now, how does that 70% get spent? Uh, do these states have the capacity to? spend that seven percent in a useful way can great uh, great great question and as yeah. you were asking it bill was writing down his answer i suppose uh, but what is your answer yeah well let's be clear on this i mean this is a huge problem in africa it's uh, one of the legacies tragically of colonialism that the colonialists divided africa up into too many small arbitrary nations that were not natural boundaries and were too s the nations were too small and so the, the africans nations started independence with kind of like just a veneer of state capacity it's what um, Lant Pritchett at the Kennedy School gives the metaphor of like constructing, you're able to construct a paper mache bridge that looks like a real bridge, but if you try to drive a truck over it, right. <laughs> it'd be pretty clear it's not, was not a real bridge. And that, you know, that some of the capacities of states are so weak that they're pa paper mache at the moment when they need to be concrete. That's a long transitional process. I think democracy helps rather than hurt in that long process of overcoming the legacy of colonialism and building up state capacity. That when citizens can really demand that their states be more effective, that, that you're gonna get a larger growth of state capacity in response to those demands. The same thing happened that, in, that happened in the US. All right, I wanna pose one last point to Ingrid here. So we have a tweet from Taylor. She says, the powerful would be powerless without the poor. Foreign aid givers need dependence of other countries. What do you think about this idea that the people who give the aid need the others to be dependent? Ingrid. Um, there's certain, certainly something to that, uh, aid the whole aid dependence discourse. Um, uh, for example, there's uh, AGOA by the US um, and aid for trade all these examples of donors giving aid and then getting certain trade, uh, good trade deals in return. Um, and I think that um, was, I liked a lot of the book, but there was something that I was missing and that was the whole global context and like global power structures. Um, individuals are important, but they're acting in a, in a global context and global processes affect them, like trade for example, and trade rules 
WTO rules, for example, that could inhibit um, developing countries from uh, giving opportunities to individuals in developing countries. So I'd like to ask this question to Bill Easterly. Um, yeah. Sure, individual rights are important, but what if these rights can't be realized? Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. What if? What about the opportunities? What if opportunities can't be realized? Sure. I um, mean, you know, I'm I'm glad you brought up the issue of uh, global trade rules, and there is a lot of U.S. protectionism against uh, against poor countries and against poor people. You know, this is a weak spot of American democracy. We act in the interests of our own citizens, but non-citizens don't vote in U.S. elections. We don't act in the interests of non-citizens. And so and this is one of the examples. We're happy to give like extreme protection to sugar growers in Louisiana uh, because they're, they're heavy campaign contributors to Louisiana <laughs> politicians. Uh, and we're neglecting the rights of much more efficient uh, sugar growers in the Caribbean who could supply U.S. consumers who would love to buy more sugar more cheaply. Everyone would benefit except a few Louisiana politicians. And I think you're very right that it's a consequence of the power structure that this happens. That is it where we're going to have to end it, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> Billy Easterly. Thank you to all of our guests. We, we're out of time, but William Easterly, Daniel Kaufman, Ken Opalo, and Ingrid harbold Pavan Graben on the next show. Our conversation will continue online, but tomorrow we'll be talking about something really interesting. Tune in. See you then.